At the end of the lesson, you are expected to identify the steps of optimization using Hessian matrix, determine the roles of derivatives in optimization using Hessian matrix, and appreciate the significance of Hessian matrix in optimization. There are times when a Jacobian matrix may not be applicable. And this happens when our function has multiple input dimensions. So when we say multiple input dimensions, it has something to do with a number of variables. So multiple means many. So multiple input dimensions means many variables. Okay. So in this case, we are using many second derivatives. So these derivatives can be collected into a matrix called Hessian matrix. And this one is a Hessian matrix, which is defined by this expression. So we have H or Hessian, the function, and then X here is, is the variable I to J, which is equal to the second derivative with respect to the derivative of XI times the derivative of XJ, FX, all right? So at this point, I believe you can already realize that Hessian and Jacobian are intimately related. So we talked about Jacobian matrix in our last lesson. The link to our Jacobian matrix lesson is given in the description below. I suggest you study lesson number 19 for you to be able to have a better understanding of this lesson and our next few lessons. Okay, so based on this expression, we can say that Hessian is the Jacobian of the gradient. So maybe you would like to ask, what if or what then if this is so? So with this, we can say that the second partial derivatives are continuous. Let me write here because it's very important. The second partial derivative is continuous and the differential operations are commutative. Okay, it's commutative. Commutative is a very important property if we are talking commutative if we're talking about Hessian matrix, okay? So, again, it's continuous and it's commutative. So, what then if the properties are commu continuous and commutative? So, because it's commutative and continuous, then the order of our variables, I mean the derivatives of the variables can be swapped. So, let's have this one. So as you could see, we have the second derivative with respect to the derivative of xi times the derivative of xj, fx. So because these two can be swapped, then we could have j here, the derivative or partial derivative xj, then we have the partial derivative xi. So first the xi can be found in here, but in then in this case, xi can be found in here and also the xj. So this swapping of places is what we call commutative, or the reason behind this is commutative. So before we continue, don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notification bell to receive updates of our machine learning, deep learning, and natural language processing courses. So to proceed to the intricate details of Hessian matrix for optimization, what should we do first is to understand the intuition behind the Hessian matrix. Okay, so this is actually our first step. Now, it is worth mentioning that gradient is the rate of change. So let me write here, we have rate of change. Okay, 
of a function. Okay, let me repeat that. It is worth mentioning that gradient is the rate of change of a function. But then, if we are talking about deep learning, this, this rate of change is called loss function, just to make it more applicable. So, because we are talking about deep learning, if this lesson is part of our course deep learning, then we may as well just use loss loss function okay okay we have that so of course we know that this loss function can be seen in all directions so remember our lessons before okay but then in this lesson we're going to mention about this one from time to time so just stay put so we've learned in our previous lessons that the, that the derivative of the loss is the amount of the loss that is resulted to if we change the input by a small amount. So let's consider this one-dimensional space as, a, as an example. So this illustration presents to us or shows to us that a certain function has only one variable. So notice the very small change in here. So if you could see this curve then if we're going to apply the loss function then it would be like this so we can draw a straight line and it's not anymore a curvy line so this used to be a curvy line this part this point of our function but then applying the derivative this becomes a straight line so this happens when we do a tiny change in the input again how much change are we going to put in the input it is just tiny we don't need to have a very big change because if we're going to do that then the tendency is our function would be distorted it would be broken and most likely our prediction would be wrong so I'm sure you don't want to do that you will never want that to happen so in here in our direction we can see that it's going up but only in this case of course in some other cases depending on our situations our goal then it can also be going down but as far as this example is concerned this is going up okay so this one direction just happens because th there is only one or this is just a one-dimensional space so in short there is only one variable that is considered so just imagine if we have a high dimensional space so we can expect different directions so it could be that we expect the direction to be going down. We can expect other directions to be going up. It could be here. It could be here. It could be here too. It could be here. It could be here. It could be here. Okay, so depending on the number of dimensions that we have. So in this case, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. We have 8 dimensions. So therefore, when we say gradient, it means the collection of derivatives of the function for each direction so this collection of derivatives is illustrated by this mathematical formula so we have in here this is the, our first direction let me write here first direction this is our second direction this is our third direction okay so maybe you would like to ask me why is it that we have three directions so we have here x and directions okay um i would like to point out that we we have here three directions because we have skipped other directions but actually this means here a lot but as far as we can only see three then we could just consider consider that they are just three directions okay okay so we have here x and direction so we have x1 we have x1 here, then we have x2, then we have xn. xn here represents more, more variables. So each element of the gradient is simply 
the slope of the function in each direction. Let me repeat that. Each element of the gradient, okay, so we have here, is simply the slope of the function in each direction. So again, as far as the three can be seen in this illustration or in this formula, then we can say that we just have three directions, okay? So the next thing to understand is the second order derivatives. So we know that it is a derivative of the derivative. So we had that in our last lesson. So please watch our last lesson for you to be able to understand what I mean by this. So we have here, here, the illustrations. So these illustrations tell us about, about the derivatives of the derivatives. So we will examine one by one. So we have here one and two illustrations. So the green arrows here that we can see here represent the derivative at each point. So differentiating the two diagrams, we can see that in the left. Let's have this one first. The change here is a lot. Why a lot? Okay, notice a direction. Okay, but then when it goes here, in this part of the curve, then it really, it abruptly goes to the left, right? So it's not actually um, a small change, but it's an, it's, it's an abrupt change when it reaches this point okay so look at look at the angle it's almost more than 90 90 degrees the change is more than 90 degrees okay so on the other hand in this illustration we can see that the change is more stable why more stable because the arrows changes just very gradually okay so Maybe you want to ask, what causes this difference? Here is abrupt and here is gradual. So the main cause is actually the curve. So here the curve is sharper, here is not. So it means to say that the sharper the curve, the more rapidly the slope changes, as can be seen by here in our number one illustration. So in the case of high dimensional spaces, we can expect different speed of change in each direction. This is the reason why second order derivatives are expressed by the Hessian matrix. What is this for? Why do we have to study this? We should understand the significance by saying that in both single dimensional and high dimensional spaces, the second order derivatives represent the curvature of the function. The only difference that we have to take note of is that the curvature may vary depending on the direction, which stands for a different set of problems. After all being said and done, let's try this. How is Hessian matrix defined? Can you explain the Hessian or can you explain the use of derivatives in Hessian matrix? And how does the inputs impact the rate of change? Please leave your answers in the comment below so that we would be able to have a very rich interaction and exchange of ideas. Do not forget to subscribe, like, and share. Please click the bell button to be notified every time we have a new session. See you in the next lesson.